morning, Grace Point. If you guys can please stand and join us for worship.
placing you fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord. good morning grace point how's everyone doing don't all answer at once. <laughs> Don't you love that when somebody asks? They're like, in, all at once, everybody say a different response, and it's just like, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> thanks, that's awesome. Um, well, if you couldn't tell, Josue is leading this morning. It's his very first time, so I'm wanting to embarrass him just a little bit. Um, but <laughs> yay! He's so excited, <laughs> as am I. Um, but if it's your first time here, welcome. I'm Chachi, the worship director here. Um, and I just, uh, I want you to invite you to don't just be here physically, be here spiritually, mentally, all of you be here and let's sing these songs together, amen?
we do it all the time. It's called Do It Again. It's one of my favorite songs. And why? It's because in the bridge it says, I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. That holds a special place in my heart as God just looking over all of us and just taking care of us. So just keep that in mind when we're singing this song. is 
Thank you, God, for letting us pray. Thank you for letting us gather here together. And that you bless us and bless Bob with the message that he has for us. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. All right. Well, welcome, Grace Point Church, in here, out there. We have reopened our back porch to be used uh, during our live feeds of our worship services. So uh, the courtyard gets a little crazy, and so we have two options for you if you want to stay outside. But since you're in here, you might as well stay, right? Um, it is good to be with you. We're going to be taking another look at the early uh, season of Jesus' ministry. We're starting a season uh, of, of, of messages calling uh, a case for Christ. And what does that mean? Uh, Mark, 16 chapters of the Gospel of Mark, one of the four stories of Jesus, he makes a case for Christ. He's more than a man, so Mark says. And he makes a case. And then you're going to see throughout this gospel the same thing that God sees today. You are either going to be in one camp or the other. You're going to bow the knee or you're going to back away. And before you make a decision, Mark says, take a look at the data. Take a look at what is available to you. So that's this story. So I'm calling this more of a journey than a, 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 a series of messages, because if it's just a series of messages, you're going to get a little smarter about Bible stuff. If you just stay here and walk this through, if it's a journey, you're going to be at a different place in your walk with God than you were when we started this series. And that's my hope and that's my desire for you. Something that'll help you in your journey towards being closer to God and experiencing more of what God has for you is to just not listen to words, but allow God to give you pictures, allow God to give you visuals, allow God to help you enter into the passion and emotion of these stories that we're going to walk through one after another for 16 chapters. And there is a series of visual stories called The Chosen that has been available now for a while. And many in our church are walking through this series together. And if you've yet to find a small group or study, we got a bunch of them. It's all on our website. Click on groups or click on upcoming events. They're all there. One option for you is to come and join many of us on Wednesday nights in this auditorium. We spread out and we group up. I do a little bit of talking. Most of the time it's discussing in groups, hearing from each other, and studying the scriptures as to what is uh, portrayed in this series called The Chosen. There's eight episodes in this first season, we're watching all eight. This coming Wednesday is episode two because it's week two. What we encourage you, if you want to join us, uh, watch the episode first and then come. It's about 45 minutes and then come ready to uh, see a few clips of it, but mostly discuss what we've already seen and we open up God's word together. And to give you a little bit of a, 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 a promo, a little sneak peek um, we put together a three-minute video to help some of you get excited about joining us on Wednesday night. So take a look. My son, they've run out of wine. Mother, my time has not yet come. If not now, when? Father. It has begun. What has? Miracles. Signs and wonders. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You have experienced a miracle, Mary. I saw him. It was incredible. 
Our Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The man has a following. He's a rogue who answers to no one. You asked me before if I knew his name. Now everyone knows his name, and I fear for his safety. Throw this down for a catch. Do you think that impossible things can happen? That overturn the laws of nature? <laughs> that cannot be explained. Rise. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. This is different. Get used to different. My whole life, I have wondered if I would see this day. Follow me, Nicodemus, and you'll see more. God loves the world in this way. He gave his only son. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. Anything is possible now. Don't you see? Let's go. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. So that's good stuff. And so uh, all the episodes are free, and you can go to our website, click on Upcoming Events, and you could go right to all those. Um, but also a number of our small groups are not doing The Chosen. They're basically walking through the Gospel of Mark and discussing these messages. And so you have options. So somewhere, somehow, beyond Sunday, find somewhere to connect with your church family. And uh, we want to grow alongside you and grow with you this, this fall, okay? So now let's get into the gospel of Mark and uh, turn in your Bibles on your phone or on your lap or whatever. Take a look at just five verses this morning. Uh, Mark chapter one, nine through 13. And uh, five verses, and we're gonna go ahead and take a look at uh, what I'm calling four early events. And uh, if we're not careful we can basically rush and race right by these because Mark doesn't give us hardly any detail. Matter of fact, Mark, the shortest of the gospel, the reason why he's the shortest gospel writer, 16 chapters, is he doesn't give us much detail. He goes from one story after another. It's fast moving. But if you go too fast, you, you miss some of the the, the, the flavor, some of the, some of the details. So we're going to walk through these five verses, but then we're also going to look at a few other verses from the other gospels and kind of color it in a bit. But uh, during uh, this week, as I kind of reflected on these five verses, these four ministry events, I thought about the journey uh, that my wife and I and one of our sons took this past summer, about a month ago. We started in San Diego, got in an RV for the very first time, and headed north. And we went way up to uh, on a, almost the Canadian border in Port Angeles, Washington. And then we turned around and, and went back. And uh, I have never driven through Oregon. I've never even driven through Northern California or Washington it's beautiful. And uh, one thing we learned is that if you go too fast, you miss some of the, the, the beauty. And so we learned to kind of slow down and, and, uh, and, and take a look at these hidden state beaches and these hidden little parks and these amazing rock structures. But if you're going 95 miles an hour, I didn't drive that all the time. And uh, you miss all these amazing things. I don't want you to miss. I don't want us to go ahead and go too fast uh, through these four events. Mark is beginning to make his case for Christ. His, his argument that Jesus is more than a good guy. And so let's take a look at these early events together. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to take 
uh, the last few minutes of this morning and kind of bring these away from 2,000 years ago to today. And so after these four ministry events that we are going to slow down to observe, how do you take it home? How do you make the revealed word of God relevant? And so that's where we're going to wrap up this morning. So here we go. Uh, Early events and insights. The first one, he just gives one verse to it, about it. He's baptized by John. Now, this isn't the Apostle John. There's a lot of Johns, a lot of Marys. Uh, So uh, a lot of names in the first century that were common, including Jesus, by the way. Uh, This is John the Dipper, or John the Baptizer, or John the Immerser. The word baptize literally means to be brought into, and to dip, or to to be brought into. And so um, John could be called, again, anything uh, related to how John and his ministry of baptizing others. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, John, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. A little bit of topography, a little bit of geography can help. And so Jesus, uh, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, way up north in the region of Galilee, pretty much in obscurity. He lived a private 30 years on a hillside in Nazareth. And basically, you really want to get to Nazareth if you get to Nazareth. Most people just went around it because it's difficult to get there. You either need to go up a ridge or down a ridge. And most people said it's just not worth it. And so Jesus was raised in obscurity. When he turned 30, the Holy Spirit prompted him, it's time. So then he travels about five days down south, and he sees John the dipper, the immerser, the baptizer. He's baptizing many women, many men, uh, many Jewish people in the Jordan River. And Jesus gets in line. And, and then he is fifth, and then fourth, and then first. And now John sees him. And then we don't get this in Mark. We do get this in the other Gospels. John is very uncomfortable about this because we looked at this a little bit last Sunday. This was not a baptism symbolizing your salvation, your forgiveness of sin. This was a baptism that you are aware of your sin. This is really more of a baptism of what is called of repentance, of of, I'm sorry for my sin. I need to deal with my sin. I need to understand I have a need for a savior. See, John was introducing and preparing people's hearts for the coming Messiah. And so we looked a little bit about that last Sunday. So now Jesus gets in line. So why would Jesus get in line with a bunch of people who were publicly acknowledging their own sin? Because Jesus was without sin. John knew that. So there was a hesitation to why Jesus was partaking in this baptism of repentance. There was no repenting needed. Take a look now over in Matthew, who spends a little bit more time than Mark does. Take a look at Matthew chapter 3, 14 and 15. We have Jesus's hesitation here. So John, the baptizer, would have prevented Jesus saying, hey, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John said, okay, then he consented. Now I shared this with the first service. I really want to encourage uh, all of you, but maybe some of you that have yet to go ahead and see your Bible a certain way. I really want to encourage you to see your Bible like a life textbook, not some sacred book that you never wrinkle or write in. And so, man, use it, write in it, circle it, put a question mark somewhere so you can go back to something and and grapple with it a little bit more. And here's the first word I would encourage you to circle. Circle the word us in verse 15. Don't miss that. See, Jesus says, let it be, I am going to be baptized with these people by you, for thus it is fitting for us 
to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus became one of us. That's this incarnation. That's this this miracle that Jesus put skin on and came from heaven to here. Now, he was not acknowledging sin, but he was acknowledging that he has become one of us to experience humanity, although he did it perfectly and we didn't, but he wanted to experience humanity with us. And so again, he wanted to not just rescue us, he wanted to be with us. We have a collection of of military men and women in our church. And I was just talking to a a recent soldier uh, this past Wednesday night. And again, it kind of got me uh, reflecting on the, the many stories that I've heard from our many men and women all around the world who have fought for our freedom. And there's another story that I was reminded of uh, that uh, was a true story that someone told me about another soldier. This other soldier was a new recruit in a rifle platoon. And this guy was excited to serve his country. He signed up and he was placed in a rifle platoon, a rifle uh, group of of soldiers that... that, that, uh, that often were laying down and and, and pulling the trigger. Well, in an early training exercise, just after it was pouring rain, he was lying down along with other rifle soldiers and lying in the mud, hard to breathe, firing his rifle. And then when he ran out of bullets, he'd put out his hand and another soldier behind him would give him another few bullets and they would reload and he would refire. He did this for a long time. He writes later that, you know, I started getting angry. (laughs) I didn't sign up for this. This is awful. I'm dirty. I'm I'm in the mud. I'm firing. And and, uh, and so he was really uh, building up some resentment. And then one time when he ran out of bullets and he reached back, he also looked back and he saw the face of the soldier behind him feeding him more bullets. It was the face of his commanding officer. It moved him. It inspired him. The fact that the commander did not need to be in the mud had other people that he could have delegated to hand him more bullets, but the commander knew the power of being a servant leader to get in the mud with his men and women, to go ahead and be with them, even as their commander. This recruit then wrote, it was then I decided I would die for that commander. I would go with him anywhere. Now, just as the commander in a muddy field with other soldiers, did not have to be there that close. Jesus did not need to be baptized, but he chose to be one of us. That's an early picture that, yes, Jesus is more than a man, more than a good teacher. Let's not forget, let's not dilute his humanity. He came to be with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Then he lived a life we could not live and he died a death we did deserve and he authenticated who he was by rising on the third day. So baptized by John. Let's go ahead and move on. Number two, he was now empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, Mark just gives one verse that he's baptized. We've got to go to the other Gospels for some more details. It's the same here. And so right after Jesus was baptized to symbolize, I'm with you, everything I do is for you, then after he's baptized, his heavenly Father kind of just pulls the curtain and speaks from heaven. Mark chapter 1, verse 10. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw, who saw? This was not for the crowd. This was for Jesus. 
Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Now we're going to get more to that in the next verse. But this is the empowerment that Jesus experienced by the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is not a bird. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. But the Holy Spirit descended not on the crowd, but on Jesus as if a dove. And that's why we get the Maranatha symbols and the dove and the Holy Spirit. We're going to get to know Jesus through this gospel. We're also going to get to know the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus starting from this moment. So the baptism by Jesus and now the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You know, let's all agree that the Holy Spirit makes a lot of people nervous. The Holy Spirit... It's just a little mystical, a little bit out there. And I'd rather just kind of focus on God the Father and God the Jesus and the Holy Scriptures. Let's leave the Holy Spirit out of it, okay? And so a lot of people get nervous. And again, there's some pretty wacky ideas. There's some pretty wrong ideas about the Holy Spirit floating around in many churchy circles. So during this gospel, as the Holy Spirit comes up a lot... We're going to get to know him. We're going to go ahead and recognize uh, the, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so again, um, the word Trinity is never in your Bible. But this is the first picture in the New Testament of the portrayal of the Trinity. You have Jesus, God the Son. You have God the Father speaking. And you have the God, the Holy Spirit, descending. So the Bible doesn't mention Trinity, but the Bible says it is undeniable of the theology of the Trinity. And what is that? God is one God in a triunity. Three persons, one God. And I have that all figured out. I don't. I can't, nor can you. I used to really be frustrated having these conversations with myself and with others about God of which I cannot fully explain. And then I came to realize, you know what, that is a good thing. Because I am so linear, I'm so logical, and I've done my homework, and I live under laws, I live in three dimensions, and I'm so glad I can't figure all of God out because that means he would be limited the way I am. He's much more than you, much more than we. And one example is the Trinity. I don't understand that. But again, it's arrogant for us to say, God, I'm not going to believe in you if I cannot fully understand you. And there's a lot of things I take advantage of that I don't fully understand. Bluetooth. Okay, that's very cool. And I, good luck explaining that. So, um, so descending on him like a dove. Um, it's interesting. Let me give you a few more verses in Matthew, Luke, and John. These other gospels, they are a little bit longer. They write with more detail. And let me give you the first one of Matthew chapter 12. A little bit later on in Jesus' ministry, we're going to see that Jesus parked, placed apart from him his deity, divine attributes of being all-powerful and all-knowing when he put skin on. He didn't begin as a baby, but when he was born as a baby, after being with his trinity for eternity, figure that one out. So now Jesus is a baby. No longer was he all-knowing and all-powerful. He grew. And we'll look at that. We'll get to know more of him through this, through, through this series. But you're going to see, and it's very clear in Scripture, that everything Jesus did and understood and performed, all of the 18 miracles that we're going to go after, one after another throughout the Gospel of Mark, was not because Jesus relied on his own power to perform them. Every moment, every movement, every miracle was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said so. Take a look at Matthew 12, 24 through 28. So when the Pharisees heard this, that Jesus was performing these miracles that, that uh, kind of authenticated the prophecies that the one who is to come promised Messiah, 
deliverer, he would be able to perform these miracles, and Jesus is just knocking them off. And so the Pharisees had this as a response. But when the Pharisees heard what Jesus was doing, they said, hey, this is not from God. It is only by Beelzebul. Well, that's not nice because Beelzebul was one of the lead demons, the prince of demons, that this man, Jesus, cast out demons. Honestly, Jesus in verse 25, you can look at this story. Jesus says, is, is that the best you have? I mean, that is not even logical. I mean, a demon would not cast out another demon because basically a house divided can't stand. Can you put another argument out there? This is what he says. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, listen, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. But now verse 28, let me tell you where the power does come from. Not from the devil. The power is going to be used to defeat the devil. But it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Over in Luke, uh, on one of these days where Jesus is teaching and ministering, as he was uh, teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, Galilee up north, Judea down south, and even from the capital, Jerusalem. And notice what it says, and the power of of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. That is a description of the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit that was with Jesus to do what God has called him to do. So when you read the scriptures, old and new, the Holy Spirit shows up to perform miracles that basically draw people to look up and and, and be drawn to God Almighty. Jesus' miracle ministry did not prove he was God the Son, the second person of the tri-person of the Trinity. Matter of fact, the same things that Jesus was able to do by the power of the Holy Spirit were already done in the Old Testament by, you know, Elisha and Elijah and Moses and these stories. You know, these guys in the Old Testament, they were able to raise the dead. They were able to change weather patterns. They were able to to, to multiply food. They were able to read people's thoughts. Were they part of the Trinity? No. Were they God incarnate? No. They were empowered by the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus of whom descended on him when Jesus basically says, now it's time for me to go ahead and start my public ministry, and start performing to authenticate that I indeed am more than a man. Take a look at John chapter 16, verse 7. That's why Jesus got so excited after he's going to do his ministry and answer his calling. You have a ministry. You have a calling, not to be anybody's savior, but you are to be a minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gets all excited. He says, listen, guys, I got to go. I know you don't want me to go, but I got to go. And it's best for you that I go because I will send another when I finally take my seat of authority beside my heavenly father in heaven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But guys, if I go and accomplish what I intend to, I will send him to you. Jesus later says, you're going to be able to do even more than I can do because there'll be more of you and continue the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. So baptized by John, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and now the third early ministry moment that, again, Mark doesn't give too much detail. We're going to go ahead and have to go a little bit outside of that to color it in. Uh, Affirmed by his heavenly father. Don't miss this one. I'm even going to go even slower through this one because like I shared with the first crowd, this is the one that I believe for many of you most likely is going to arouse some pain and arouse a gap and arouse something that is wrong. So let's take a look at this together. 
He's affirmed by his heavenly father. Don't miss this. Let's slow down and slowly read just this one verse. Let me start in verse 10. Let's ramp it up. When he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, the spirit descending like a dove. And then God the Father speaks. And a voice came from heaven. It doesn't say to the crowd. Jesus' heavenly Father had something for Jesus to hear. You, Jesus, are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Now, Jesus spent 30 years on a hillside in Galilee where most people would never have seen him. Most people don't want to go to Nazareth because Nazareth itself had a tarnished reputation. And Jesus lived faithfully, caring for his family, caring for his mom and his younger brothers and sisters. And that pleased his heavenly father. See, Jesus didn't choose to live privately or publicly by himself. He continued to answer God's faithful calling on his life. But when he turned 30, the Holy Spirit says, now it's time for you to leave Nazareth and go down south and go public of who you are and what you were sent to do. Jesus knew that just a few years later, after going public, he'd be killed. Jesus knew he'd live a lot more comfortable if he just stayed quiet up on a hillside. But he moved away from comfort and started moving towards his crucifixion. And the father knew what Jesus knew. And his heavenly father said, Jesus, I just want you to know something because I know and you know where this is going to lead. They're going to hate you. They're going to kill you. But I want you to know that I love you. I am so pleased that you will continue to be faithful. Now, here's a question. Do you think Jesus already knew that he was loved by his heavenly father? Yes. Yes. Do you think his heavenly father knew that Jesus already knew? Yes. So why on earth was this proclamation given from heaven? Because Jesus was grounded. He was moved when he heard that. Because every child should hear that. Every child, including you, should have heard that by now. And in a crowd this size, and it was the same for the first service, I can confidently say, sadly say, some of you, you've never heard that. Because you weren't perfect, and you were different, and you made some mistakes, and your best efforts were never good enough. You never heard, I love you, and I am so pleased with you, and I see strength in you. I see value in you. You were made to hear that from your mom and dad. Some of you, you still might hear that eventually. If you haven't heard it by now, there's a good chance you never will from them. And if you haven't heard it by now, there's some healing that needs to happen in your heart. There does. There's a gap. There's a hole. There is a hurt. And I'd encourage you, don't try to fill that in any way that is close by. You need some counseling. You need some brotherly and sisterly love from a church family. But if there is that hole there, you're going to want to fill it. I want you to have the humility and the courage to let God fill it the way he wants to. Jesus needed to hear that as a man, as a son, just as much as you did. It moved him. It grounded him. And I'm going to share a little bit more about that a little bit later on. So now what do we do? Listen to me. We're broken, you and I. 
And there's some things that we ought to have experienced that we haven't yet. Sometimes we won't from where it should come from. Let's decide by the power of God himself that we would be able to somehow pass on a better baton to the next generation. I'm just not talking about moms and dads here. I'm talking about you as a member of God's family. You are responsible of raising up the next spiritual generation. And one of the ways you can do that is find someone a little bit behind you and just say, you know, I see something in you. I see you. God's delighted with what I see because I know he sees it. Do you know how loved you are? Those words are going to fall and be powerful if we choose to respond to that. So I'd encourage you, moms and dads, listen to me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dad. I want my kids to never doubt that I love them and I'm pleased with them. And honestly, uh, we all can work to do that better. You do not have to approve of everything. You don't have to like them all the time but you can love them and you can communicate delight in them. Parents, if you have any doubt, well, I think my, you know, I, I, I no, T -t -t today, you, you gotta, you gotta cement that in. Affirmed by his heavenly father. I'm not going to go after that. On your outline, there are other passages that we're not going to go after. Two times in the Gospels, two times in Jesus' ministry, one in the beginning, one towards the end, did heavens open up and Jesus here, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The first one was at the baptism. The last one was just north of a place called Caesarea Philippi, and I've given you those verses on your outline, and I downloaded them on, 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 on those watching at home. Let me just give you a little bit of a snippet of the end, and you can fill it, and you can read it for yourself. Just eight days before he started traveling up to what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, he pulls some closest disciples aside and says, guys, it's about to really heat up. He knows that. This is the last time he's going to start moving down to Jerusalem because they're waiting for him down there. If you ever come back, we're going to kill you. Jesus knew that. He knew every step south in the last trip down, he will not get out of there alive. He will be carried out dead. He tells his closest followers, soon I will be betrayed. Soon I will be killed. But guys, the story doesn't end there. Soon after that, three days, I will be raised. And then he goes to just spend some quiet time on a mount with his heavenly father. And some of you know some of that story. And a couple famous Old Testament folks show up. And that's where God again says, Jesus, I love you. I'm so proud of you. I delight in how faithful you have been and you are going to be. You need to hear that. I'll be honest with you, as a church family, we need to tell that to each other. If you're in a small group, you need to tell people when you see God at work and people need to encourage one another. So many people are just based on their performance and not based on the grace that God wants them to experience. All right, enough said on that. Baptized by John, empowered by the Holy Spirit, affirmed by his heavenly father. Number four, tempted by the devil. Again, Mark doesn't give much time on this one. We got to go to other gospel writers to unpack that a little bit more. Um, so let's take a look at this. Tempted by the devil. The devil wastes no time. Did the devil taunt Jesus his first 30 years? No. Personally, I think, you know, if you want to stay private, you want to stay on a hillside, I'm going to leave you alone. You go public, I'm coming for you. It's the same thing for us today. We tell this every time people get baptized or people share a testimony, people step up to serve. If you want the devil to leave you alone, you don't answer the calling of God on your life. But if you start saying, you know what? I was made for more. 
I was made to invest. I was made to bless. I'm blessed to bless. You start going that route. Now, the Bible says greater is he that is in you. That's the Holy Spirit than he that is in the world. But he's coming for you. And you need a local church family beside you. If you are by yourself on the rifle range, firing away, you are out of God's will. You need to have fellow brothers and sisters, soldiers beside you. And I'm grateful that this church is full of people that would consider it a privilege to walk with you as they walk with us. So tempted by the devil, the devil wastes no time. You're going to get baptized. You're going to go ahead and start declaring who you are. I'm coming for you. So right after the baptism, take a look what it says in Mark, last two verses, 12 and 13. The spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Okay, Mark, that's a strong word, drove. If that was the only gospel, you'd think that Jesus went kicking and screaming, okay? And so the word literally does not mean that Jesus was reluctant, but Jesus was influenced and guided and directed powerfully by not just this moment, but throughout his ministry. And you're going to see this in Luke chapter 4. So the Spirit drove Jesus, guided him, directed him away from the river into a dry area called the wilderness between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. And he was in the wilderness area for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals who lived out in the wilderness and the angels were there ministering to him. Now, that kind of gives you the summary, but there's more to the story. So we're not going to teach through Luke. I did that some years ago, but I need to give you a little bit of Luke to flavor this story. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 4, 1 and 2. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, don't miss that, full of the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. He was not a rogue person at this point. He never was. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, he returned from the Jordan And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And here's a little bit more detail. And he ate nothing during those days. He fasted for 40 days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. You think, right? And Luke chapter 4 describes the devil waited until when Jesus was at his weakest. And let's all agree, that is not nice, right? But that's what the devil does back then and today. If he wants to weaken you, he's going to wait until you are more prone to listen to what he is tempting you to do. He won't go after you on your good days. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit out and he was hungry. And then he goes after Jesus with three I'm going to call classic temptations. And here's the deal. We're not going to, I'm not going to go through all this. Jesus responds. He quotes a little bit of Deuteronomy three times, and there's a lot of stuff here. But here's what I want to do. I want to summarize these three temptations because these are the same temptation strategies that the devil is going to try to derail you with. And I'm going to summarize all three with what I'm calling the temptation of assumption. Please remember that because if you assume what the devil wants you to assume when he's bringing temptation your way, you're going to fall away from God. You're going to move from temptation to sin. And let's take a little look at this and then let's go ahead and, and, uh, and get to the life lessons. Here's the first of the three temptations that the devil went at Jesus with after 40 days of fasting. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, if you are the one that you claim to be and that had that amazing baptism moment, well, command this stone to become bread. Now get this, Jesus is really, really hungry and he had a legitimate need for nourishment. If he doesn't eat soon, he's going to die, okay? Here's the assumption, Jesus, is that a legitimate need? Yes, it is. 
So since it's a legitimate need, God wants to meet that need. And there's a rock right there that could be easily turned to bread. So doesn't God want to satisfy your needs? So why don't you go ahead and let that rock be the source of provision? See, the assumption is that I can go ahead and pursue God providing for me in a way that makes sense that's right in front of me. And that would be wrong more times than not. Because God's will for you often is to wait. See, God's will doesn't just have uh, uh, a, 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 a way to care for you. It has a how. So how God cares for you is, is very important. You have sexual needs. You have relational needs. You have emotional needs. They are legitimate And for many of you, God is calling you to wait to have some of those needs fulfilled in a way that God wants to provide for you. But there's a rock right there. And God, this is legitimate. You made me with this need. And if that rock can satisfy it, I'm just going to assume that that is your will for me. The temptation of assumption. So God's provision has a how. God, there is a need. You made me with this need, but how you're going to meet this need is something I need to go ahead and go to you about. Temptation number two, temptation of assumption. Okay, Jesus, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. The devil said that. Interesting. Jesus didn't correct him. The devil was able to give Jesus the authority that basically was given to the devil way back in the Garden of Eden, if you know some of the Old Testament. If you then will just worship me, me, I will give you the authority and glory that you believe will one day be yours. What's the assumption? God's will, God's provision doesn't just have a how, so don't just assume any rock is God's will for you. God's will also has a when. Question, is it God's will for all authority and glory to be given to Jesus eventually? The answer is yes. Jesus knew that after his death, resurrection, ascension, all authority is going to be given to him. You know what the devil said? Well, if God's going to do it later, why don't you just take it now? Just, just, Just grab it now. Why go down that road? Just get it now if God promises he will give it to you later. Listen to me. God's will for your life has a when. And God's timing typically is not your timing. And some churchy circles believe just pursue in a way that makes sense to you God's promises for you. Just because God's promised it doesn't mean that, again, he's going to give it to you when you want him to. The third temptation, we're going through this fast. We'll get back to Mark. Here's the third temptation. It's also a temptation of assumption. Luke 4, 9, 10, 11. Okay, Jesus, if you are the son of God, all right, throw yourself down from here for it is written. Now he loosely quotes Psalms 91. The devil knows the Bible too, by the way. God will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And and on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What's the assumption? If God can powerfully protect you, then just go ahead and assume he will. Why don't you just throw yourself off a building? Church, I would strongly encourage you not to go ahead and jump out of a plane without a parachute and then pray on the way down. I would strongly encourage you to take your gambling habit seriously and stop irresponsibly wasting your finances and then praying for Jehovah Jireh, God the provider, to show up and pray that God will help you win the lottery or something like that. 
See, again, the assumption is just because God's powerful enough to do it, that means he will do it when I get myself in a mess. God just might allow you to have a humbling moment so you don't think that he's your genie. He's your, he's your uh, deity that you can go ahead and manipulate. So that was what Jesus said, listen, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. And some of us sometimes were tempted to tempt God by putting ourselves in messes and then asking God to bail us out. You know what? In those messes, he might, but he also might not. All right, so that's, those are the four early ministry events. Let me give you four life lessons now. Okay, Bob, information, helpful, crazy stuff helpful. How do I take it home? Let me give you four opportunities for you to consider to take at least one of these home. Four life lessons. Now, before we get there, why do we spend some time with life lessons after we listen to the scriptures? Well, because all scripture, including Mark chapter 1, 9 through 13, it's inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true. It is true. But then God says, but there's more. And to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. How are we not living in light of that truth? And then he's going to want to correct us and then teach us to live it out and do what's right. So then how do we do this practically? Let me give you four life lessons on your outline. Here's the first one. It's not sin to be tempted to sin. Listen to me. We struggle because we are attracted to sin. Being attracted to sin, being tempted to sin is not a sin. And some of you, you're living with such heavy, false guilt. You're doubting your heart for God, your passion for God because of the crazy temptations that are floating around. And you're thinking, I can't believe what I just thought. And even more than that, what I am being attracted to consider Listen to me, listen to me. Being attracted to something that you know is not of God, that is contrary to scripture, is not sin. But temptation turns to sin when there's action, when there's, there's, there's movement. I like what Martin Luther said way back in the day. Martin Luther said, you know what? It's not a sin to be tempted, just like it's, it, it's, you can't help from birds flying over your brain, but you can help and keep them from making a nest in your hair. That's good theology, okay? So listen, there's some crazy birds and there's some crazy temptations that are going to fly over you. Just let them keep on flying. Do not let them make a nest in your hair. Let me say something else. You are attracted to certain sins like you are attracted to certain desserts. You know, in the dessert menu, Rhonda looks at, I'm not attracted to the same thing she is. I'm more of a vanilla guy. She's more of a chocolate gal. But we all have our own attractions. Does that make sense? Will you quit judging other people who are attracted to other things that you're not attracted to? You are attracted to your own temptations. And let me tell you something, God is, or the devil is not going to go at you in something that you are not attracted to. He's going to go after you when you're weakest, and he's going to go after the areas that you're more prone to act upon. We all have them, but temptation is not a sin. Some of you, your guilt is false guilt because you feel terrible that you are attracted to something that you've yet to do. And well, then, if, then I'm, I guess I've already done it. You have not. You have not. Number two, uh, it's not smart to assume God's plan. I spent a lot of time on that already, uh, the temptation of assumption. Let me give you two verses to help us out this week. Don't let the assumption win the day. Let the peace of Christ win the day. I like Colossians 3.15. God, I'm thinking about doing something because that would meet a legitimate need in my life. But before I do it, God, I need to pause and pray. God, I want the peace that comes from you. Guide me to it or away from it. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. 
And then the last one too, man, store up God's word in your heart. That's what Jesus did. He quoted scripture every time the devil came his way. And so the more you store God's word in your heart, in your mind, the more the Holy Spirit can draw it out and use it to go ahead as a sword to go ahead and fight the tempter off. It's not smart to assume God's plan. Uh, number three, uh, it's, not, it's not sunny always when faithful. What do I mean by that? There's a lot of stories. Actually, we're intending to give you more. I put those references on your outline, but we're not going to go there because we're, we're running out. But here's the deal. It's enough to know that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, was in a very dry place. You will hear in churchy circles, sadly, more than a few, that if you're walking with God, if you're in the will of God, there will always be a waterfall nearby. God will never lead you into a dry season. That'll, God will never lead you in, a, in an area, in a, in, a, in, a, in a season where you're more comfortable than you already are. God wants you to be healthier and wealthier tomorrow than you are today. Friends, that is biblical garbage. It's just not true. And the reason why I have such passion about this one is if you believe that if I'm full of the Holy Spirit, if I'm led by the Holy Spirit, then life is just going to get better and better and better for me and not lonelier at times. You're going to be confused and possibly even abandon your faith. Jesus was led by the Spirit into a very dry place where there were wild animals. Can your theology handle that? Now, God was with him, but it was a very challenging time. One last one. It's not secure when needing horizontal approval. What do I mean by that? Listen to me, when we have the vertical approval from our Heavenly Father, when we hear and we recognize, I am loved and He delights in me, then I can more live for an audience of one, I can live for an audience of Him, and it really doesn't matter what other people think. Some of you are chained to the opinions and the approvals of others, and you want to step out, to do this or not do this, but what will they think? You know, Jesus was free from that. You know, that is why Jesus, when no one else will, he put a towel around his waist, he got on his hands and knees, and he washed 24 smelly feet. 12 disciples times two. Take a look at John 13 real quick. I know if you're in churchy circles long enough, you have re remember the John 13, Jesus washed people's feet. Have you ever wondered what fueled him to be able to humble himself that much and do what basically servants, low servants, were, 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 were called to do? Take a look what it says in John 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. That's security. He, his vertical was, 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 was good. So then he can serve. Rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments. He'd taken a towel, tied it around his waist, and he poured water and began to wash his disciples' feet, wiped them in a towel, wrapped around him. What fueled that? I'm good with God. I, I'm, I'm good enough. Therefore, I can go to my wife. I can go to my kids. I can go to my friends. I can go to those that I have difficulty with. And I don't need anything from them because God has filled me with his presence, his love, his spirit. And I'll let that pour out. You know what is a classic death of a marriage? Well, you know what? I'm going to do it, but they got to do it first. You don't understand, Bob. She hasn't blah, blah, blah. We can go to God and be vertically filled and fueled so much that we can go to other people and wash their feet and love them and love them and love them. 
It doesn't mean be abused by them. It doesn't mean to ignore a potential issue that you need to get away from. But may we love others, not because they will love us back, but because we were loved first. Last verse, and then we're going to pray. We love because he first loved us. You bow your heads, let's pray. Father, thank you for this introductory to this long series of the gospel of Mark. We've already heard enough, God, to be humbled and to draw closer to you. Father, thank you for the ministry that we see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that's available now, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I pray you help us understand how we can tap into that power more for your glory. Father, may we be so vertically strong with you that we would be more fueled, more secure, more grounded, that we can become the givers and the servant leaders you are calling us to be. Father, give us insights. Give us the strength and power to live them out as we journey together through the gospel of Mark. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you are loved by your maker. I want you to embrace that as we sing this last worship moment. I'll be right back with uh, with the last word. Take their place with some.
going to sing this, heal my heart and make it clean. Good stuff. Have a seat real quick. And uh, if Sunday was the only thing that you needed and that we offered, I'd let you go right now. But it's not. There's a lot of things that we offer beyond Sundays that honestly, we really want you to take advantage of. And so Kurt Staker's going to come up. We have weekly small groups and studies, and we have monthly and even quarterly events from time to time. And guys, this one, this one's for you. You have that slide, fellas? Excellent. Hey, I, I passed by, so I'm Kurt, a member of the Grace Point Church Men's Ministry. And good news, we're having another uh, men's breakfast uh, next, uh, next Saturday morning. Be here in the courtyard, 7 a.m. ends promptly at 8.29 a.m. Please join us. It's uh, great food. We're going to have bacon, eggs, rolls, fruit, juice, coffee, and, of course, extra bacon. And backed by popular demand... We're bringing back the hash browns. So there you go. You guys had asked for them last time. We have them back this time. And we do not have any extra statin pills. You bring your own. And, um, but I still need, we still need volunteers for this. We need servers. We need um, uh, preparation, cooking, cleaning, especially the cleanup afterwards. So if you want to volunteer, there's my email, ad- or my email address is chstaker at yahoo.com. And you find that on the website as well. If you haven't been to one before, the agenda is we, we dish up and we pray, and there's a worship afterwards. Then there's a talk, or a testimony and a talk. And Pastor Bob emailed me last night, a couple of folks that I believe will be speaking next week. It sounds great. I won't say the names because I don't know if Pastor Bob has told them they're speaking or not at this point. And, uh, and I also want to remind you all that, um, um, that uh, 1 p.m. Uh, next Saturday is also a uh, drive for Centro Shalom. And men that come to the breakfast, if you want to bring your goods and your food, just bring it to the breakfast. I'll be, I'll be at it, of course. Bob Campbell will make sure your stuff gets to Central Shalom. And uh, let's just, the, the Pastor Bob said we need more than Sunday to keep our spirituality meter fueled through the week. These types of gathering are important as they, they really do. I, I watch, I observe, them forge friendships with fellow Christ followers, true fellowship. And I, I believe that this emboldens us to speak the word to others when we walk out of the breakfast, out of that spiritual breakfast. And it also really provides encouragement and accountability for each other as men in, this, in these gatherings. Really look forward to seeing you all next Saturday. Thanks, Pastor Bob. Where are we going to be next Saturday morning? In the courtyard. Yeah, we're going to be outside, guys. So again, we're going to be serving and staying outside. And uh, so that's, that's basically the, the season that, that we are still in. All right, so we encourage you to come on like that. He quickly mentioned next Saturday, we also have our donation drive, our next donation drive for the ministries and the families uh, in Tijuana. It is a privilege, but it's also a responsibility to care for those we are called to care for. And uh, that is one of the uh, communities that God has laid on our heart, that God's heart is broken over already. And so... Um, look on our website, 
drive up between one and three. You don't have to get out of your car, drop off some stuff that's on a list there. We're going after school supplies and hygiene and food. And uh, if you looked at the news these days, Tijuana is a mess. And uh, so in the greatest messes are the most ministry opportunities that I think I want us to go ahead and dive right into. So I hope you hope you do that. Quick answer to prayer. We're broadening our staff. One of the ways that we have just brought in our staff, we just hired a communications director and a Tiana Kalumpit. She's actually up in our uh, tech area up there. She works during the week. So I just want you to know that God does answer prayer. We're very excited for, for Tiana. Find a small group, find a study, find a breakfast somewhere somehow this week. And let's be a church family together, all right? Thanks for coming. See you next week.